Yes. I request everyone to stand up for national anthem. very pleasant morning to everyone present here. I, Kinzel Makwana, your host, and on behalf of Nari Gursani Law College, welcomes you all today, where we will be discussing compulsory licensing and access to medicines via Indian healthcare system during COVID-19. Today, we are graced by the presence of Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani sir and Professor Garima Panwar. So firstly, I will request our beloved principal, Dr. Nilima Chandiramani, ma'am, to welcome our esteemed guests. A very good morning to our keynote speaker, Honorable Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, our guest speaker, Professor Garima Panwar, my colleagues, my staff, and dear students. Padma Bhushan Dr. L.H. Hiranandani left behind gigantic footsteps, footprints on the sands of time. We have much to learn from his life, his struggles, his contributions to society and achievement. A very humble tribute to this great icon is this annual event which we host in his memory. On this ninth memorial, we decided to have an online talk on healthcare during this pandemic, a subject which I'm sure will be very close to his heart. And on this occasion, we have with us none other than his very own illustrious son, Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, Honorable Provost of HSNC University, trustee and past president of HSNC Board, recipient of Mumbai Ratna Award, who is known not only for his excellence in changing the skyline of Mumbai city, but also for his commitment to the cause of education, healthcare, religious, and charitable trust. Sir, we are indeed honored and delighted to have you amidst us. On behalf of all assembled here, I extend a very warm welcome to you with a round of applause on behalf of all. We also have with us the soft-spoken and gentle but down-to-earth Professor Garima Panwar from Hidayatullah National Law University as the guest speaker. She has conducted, she has been very supportive in the past and has conducted summer certificate courses on artificial intelligence for our students and she did it pro bono. She is also helping us with our upcoming event on the 12th Nari Gursani Festival. A huge and a warm welcome, dear Garima, and we look forward to your continued support. Happy learning to all. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. As we are here gathered for the ninth Padma Bhushan Dr. L.H. Hiranandani Memorial Talk, 
I would like to see, speak to you a few things about our beloved doctor. Dr. Lakumal Hiranand Hiranandani was an Indian otorhinolaryngologist, social activist, and philanthropist. Born in 1917 in Kharta of the then Sindh province, Dr. Hiranandani had limited financial means, but his ability and his ambition defeated the former. He is known for pioneering several surgical procedures, which later came to be known as Dr. Hiranandani's operations. He was the founder chairman of Hiranandani Foundation Trust, which was reported to have been active in the social movement against organ trade in India. He was the recipient of Golden Award of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, the first Indian and the fifth overall to receive the honor. The government of India awarded him with the highest, third highest civil honor, that is Padma Bhushan, in 1972 for his contributions to medicine and society. Dr. Hiranandani was a member of the American Society of Head and Neck Surgery, the first Indian to be accorded a membership at AHNS. In his struggle, trim, and life, is embedded the story of a man who contributed to make this world a better place to live in. In 1972, when drought hit Mumbai, he, Dr. Hiranandani abandoned his medical practice and organized medical aid and immunization camps to the drought-affected people, serving as the honorary medical director. The next year, he worked in Bihar and Odisha, which were affected by floods. And in the aftermath of the Bombay riots of 1993, he worked for organizing medical aid to the injured people. His dream was to wipe every tear from every eye, especially in Ulhasnagar, a city closest to his heart. Magnanimity came to him easily. He could show grace even in difficult situations. He effortlessly established magical relationships with people, big or small, and made them feel special. It was a consoling word or soothing touch, as much as being in the presence of his kindness, that left an indelible imprint on in one's memory. For the HSNCI, he was a shepherd. He remained behind the herd, allowing others to go forward. Without realizing, they were all guided, supported, and directed from behind. As every great deed begets another, a great leader like Dr. L. H. Hiranandani inspires other leaders to greatness. What comes in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what the difference we have made in other life that makes the significance of the life we have led. This is the lesson we have learned from our dear and beloved doctor. Dr. L. H. Hiranandani, a legend, completed his journey on earth on 5 September 2013. His story and inspiration to millions shall last for an eternity. Rarely is a person loved and respected so much and by so many as this tallest patron. We all have lost a great human being. And nothing can diminish the profound and enduring loss of this good Samaritan and symbol of peace with his aura of gracious humility and unimpeachable integrity. Instead of mourning for him, which he surely would not have liked, we are going to celebrate his remarkable life, his achievement, his contributions, and his service to mankind and society. Now, I call upon Amisha Jain to introduce Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, sir. Thank you so much, Kinjal. It is indeed my privilege to introduce the great and most respectfully, Dr. Hiranandani. Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani is the trustee and past president of the Hyderabad Sindh National Collegiate Board which runs about 17 colleges and eight schools. Sir holds a reputed position of national president of the National Real Estate Development Council, functioning under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. He also represents Associated Chambers of Commerce and Industry of India as its president. Sir is a co-founder and managing director of Hiranandani Group, a group particularly known for its efforts in redesigning the skyline of Mumbai and transformation of Hawaii, among many others. Sir has also served as the president of Indian Merchants Chamber. Notably, Sir is the provost of our recently inaugurated HSNC University. And he was also a member of task force 
formed by the government of India for making valuable contributions to the national education policy. Niranjan sir is an alumnus of Campion School, Mumbai, and a rank holder in commerce from Mumbai University. He completed his FCA from Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and he was further bestowed with a doctoral degree in management for his thesis on real estate. Sir had made enormous contribution in the policy framing for slum rehabilitation in Mumbai, which was designed to improve the well-being of over 6 million inhabitants. Sir had been a proactive member of many premier organizations and township projects. For, for instance, he acted as an advisor to the government of India on housing and habitat policy for over a decade. Today, he is ranked among, by, Forbes, by Forbes among the most richest Indians. Do you remember Thomas Edison? He's famous for saying, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 that won't work. Sir, success can be rightly owed to those 10,000 failures during the initial stages of his career into real estate, which has made him a possibilitarian and a visionary in this field. Remarkably, Sir is a first generation entrepreneur and what makes him stand apart is his constant effort to do better. He is known to have played a leadership role in revamping the infrastructure at Lokanwala complex by forming an association to build internal roads and put on the street lights and good water supply facilities, etc., which has made a world of a difference to the residents of this place. But there were many places like Lokanwala complex, but there was an absence of basic infrastructure. And this picture had a deep impression on it. I think the introduction was too long, so it needed to be cut off correctly. <laughs> I think, sir, she's got disconnected. No, uh, no, it's okay. Now let's yeah. get on to it. Yes. Kinjal, please proceed. Yes, ma'am. Now I request Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, sir, to share his valuable thoughts with us. Uh, a very, very good afternoon. Good morning to each and every one of you. In a few minutes, it will be good afternoon. So may I wish you the same. So before I conclude, it will be good afternoon. So may I do both of them just now. Uh, I must thank uh, Principal Nilima Chandiramani for the wonderful leadership that she has shown in the college, built it to great fervor. First, the Casey College, the HSNC board, now the uh, Nari Kursani College is doing wonderfully well under your leadership. Thank you very much for the wonderful leadership that you have shown and also the great activities and other parts of it which you are doing, including your kindness in setting up this program for today. So I'm really, really grateful to you. And uh, of course, it's a touching thing that it has been named after my father, Dr. Eli Chiranandani, who stood out and very kind of you uh, to have made whatever uh, this thing. Amisha uh, Jain did a great job of doing all that in terms of speaking about it and also Garima uh, Panwar. Uh, I'm, uh, the, the topic of today has been about the usual in -care health, Indian healthcare system and the pros and cons of it during the COVID times. I think this has been a challenge of the century. No matter what we may say, uh, we have had a huge, we have a huge population, a big challenge in our terms of access to healthcare, a, a very small proportion of our GDP is invested into healthcare, Urban cities still have semblances of healthcare, which are fairly good, but in the remoter areas, uh, in the tier two, tier three cities, as well as in rural areas, there have been huge challenges in order to take care of the issues of the pandemic, which has taken place in, in first all over the world. And then of course, intrusion into India too. And we have gone and seen two terrible waves that have taken place. The challenge, of course, has been adequately met, not in the first phase, 
because we were not knowing at all like the rest of the world as to what the problem was. And with a faltering investment in uh, healthcare systems, we were not able to take adequate care for most of the people. First of all, medicines were not available and these had to be controlled and licensed by the government at the center and at the state level, which brought about. Second, there was a revamping both of the public and uh, private sector uh, healthcare systems. And third, there was a control taken over in terms of licensing the number of beds that were made available in the private sector. So the government insisted that 70 to 80% of the beds should be reserved for COVID patients. And there was a, a, a maximum amount of cost that you could charge the patients for the purposes of, uh, I'm sorry, charge for the COVID patients who were admitted into the private hospitals too. So there were multiple challenges that we faced uh, in terms of medical aid, uh, in terms of medicines, then uh, thirdly, in terms of oxygen availability. One of the prime supporters of uh, COVID uh, care is the requirement of adequate oxygen to be delivered to the patient in a particular manner, uh, which is done by the hospitals. And in later on, it was also done by other clinics and uh, some even at the residences of the people. However, oxygen was never, never required in the healthcare system in such a large manner. So the government actually acquired the surplus oxygen available in the entire country, including industrial operations, and even shut down many industrial operations because they needed to divert the production of oxygen into the healthcare system. So this was one of the major activities which took place in order to save lives in terms of the system. However, over a period of time, this was supplemented by introducing several fast and quick methods of producing oxygen. For example, the Dr. L. H. Hiranandani Hospital in Pawai has a now a PSA plant which produces oxygen and can take care of 99% of the requirements of oxygen for the hospital, even during COVID times. The reason I say 99.9 .9 is because if there is a failure in the mechanical system uh, of the operation, you do need some oxygen availability from other sources as a standby operation till the equipment of oxygen can be really restored. The next part of it, which became controlled, uh, was the issue of medical medicines, which were uh, really required for the COVID patients and also the protocols which were needed for giving to the patients. So the protocols were changed from time to time and these were confirmed by uh, the authority at the center government and at the state government level and also the World Health Organizations who issued mandatory uh, directions to the various governments all over the world in order to follow a certain protocol of medicines as they had then understood. However, these protocols after the learning changed practically from time to time. And on the basis of that, mandates were issued by the center government under the Disaster Management Act in order to see to it that adequacy of medicine was given, but excessive medicine was not given. And in some cases, patients have actually had a big problem because excessive medicines have been given in terms of uh, certain private nursing homes and others, which created a lot of difficulty in handling of patients at the level. The next part of it was the system followed where compulsory uh, movement was banned. So the lockdown was of course at the national level called by the Honorable Prime Minister which was probably one of the strongest actions taken in, in the history of India uh, for the last hundred years at least, 
wherein a lot of transportation, movement, uh, closure down of shops, establishments, offices, schools, colleges, and every institutions took place. All this under the Disaster Management Act. And uh, these were supported by various government actions in terms of it. Now comes the last part of it. The last part of it, and probably the best part of it, was the fact that we got into the vaccination mode. Fortunately for us, India is one of the largest manufacturers of good vaccine, great vaccine uh, in the entire world. And these manufacturers, in fact, not only produce vaccines for our country, but also for many parts of the world. And they have been doing it for many years, even earlier. So the, the entire thing has now provided to see that vaccination is the best methodology by which we can uh, contain COVID. I use the word contain COVID and not eliminate COVID because the vaccines do not eliminate you from getting COVID, but it certainly mitigates you 99.9% .9 in order to save you from death. And, uh, and mortality. So a lot of emphasis has now shifted from uh, clinical care to preventive care. And this of course uh, is in addition to masking, safe distancing, not making crowds and passing necessary orders under the Disaster Management Act in order not to have uh, Ganesh type of festivals where more people will attend and uh, our various other gatherings, political, religious, uh, weddings and others, the numbers for such programs being contained in order to take care of it. Last and last the least, uh, the entire system is now turning around to find out what the future holds for us. So there are three aspects to it. The first and probably picked up from the last point that I just mentioned, is that we should vaccinate all. Uh, we have done a huge amount, especially in the urban areas and the congested areas, which have taken place completely. And uh, very soon it will be found that uh, without taking two vaccines, you may not be permitted to travel. You may not be able to go into any premises. You may not be able to go to your workplace. All these will mandate that at least two uh, vaccines, both the vaccines would have been taken, two doses of vaccines would have been taken by you in order to make a difference. So this entire licensing control of the handling of COVID has been effectively managed both at the center and state level in order to see that uh, we mitigate uh, the problem of uh, healthcare in order to do it and to provide adequate support in terms of various aspects of it in order to prevent it from sifting. It is the further uh, statement that people have making that the expectation is that there will be a third wave. However, the effect of the third wave will not be as serious as the first and second wave and the healthcare systems, the medicines, the oxygen supply and other factors will prevent deaths from taking place hugely. And hence the system, which is now the control system, which has now been followed and the permission or access to medical help in various formats, whether in terms of the public domain, in terms of government hospitals and other things, in terms of the private domain, in terms of accessibility to medicines, the price of healthcare in terms of COVID healthcare that is to be done, and all the other systems are now falling into place in order to make it successful. A lot has been said and a lot has been done. The economy is now moving back into the situation, but will the changes which took place in terms of how we will dominate this world or move with the world or work in this world has definitely taken a shift couple of things which I can flag off. Number one, we would never imagine to hold conferences like this on the video system. It is my belief that uh, the future holds 
that we will continue to use the video conferencing system, which will be available to there, so that even from remote lo locations, I have, we are accessible to each other. However, I, for one, belonging to the old scheme of things, would love to meet each and every one of you personally in order to be able to talk to you, meet you, uh, you know, interact with you. And that's a question that we all have. To what extent is this, social, this uh, safe distancing going to become social distancing? And that's a big question. Corporates also are now talking about it in terms of return or going back to work, but there is a big controversy. Can some of those people who go back to work do not need to go back to the offices? So this is a new change in terms of the language and talk which we are doing off. I do believe that the answer is in what we talked about several years ago, which was blended learning. Now I think even in activities, we are going to have blended social activities. Doesn't sound very good, but nevertheless, it looks like the fate of things. So people may come for marriage functions personally, and others will attend to it through the video conferencing route. My God, what a change. Never imagined a couple of years that we could even talk about it, think about it, and participate in it. Can you imagine the host and hosted connecting you on the internet and saying, watch the marriage and bless the couple through the video system? But yes, that is what is looking like is going to happen. In the teaching and learning profession, I think it's much more a story of yes, the blended learning and teaching is here to stay. And the best example of this is Principal Nilima Chandiramani, who has taken the blended learning systems as a fish into water and has done a fantastic job of doing with technology, which was unknown to her maybe a couple of years ago. So I think this is a new change that has taken place in the systems that are going to be there. So life will have changed completely and permanently. As far as the uh, COVID story is concerned, it is my belief, and I, time will tell whether we are right or wrong, is the fact that COVID will be like any other disease, and there are plenty, influenza, uh, we have malaria, we have dengue, and in some cases, even the, the, the diseases of uh, dengue and uh, malaria in my hospital today is more than the COVID uh, patients. Uh, so uh, in reality, we will forget that there was a story like COVID, and I would love to forget about it, but it doesn't seem to be going away quickly, and we hope that this is going to do. So I think what we have learned is that life has changed. This change would not have happened but for the COVID times. There is some good in what has happened. The government has learned, but learned one very important thing, that the investments into healthcare and education is not adequate. And we need to support, supplement, and move on it. The new uh, national education policy now being incorporated and Dr. Mashalka's report we now submitted to the government of state of Maharashtra, of whom, which I was a part, uh, is going to make a paradigm shift in the methodologies of teaching and learning in this thing. So systems will change, regulations will change, licensing will change, methodologies will change. So the only guarantee of the future is one, things will change. We have to learn from our past and move into the future and to have better lives, good lives, and lives which are improved in the new environment of tomorrow. I wish each and every one of you the very best on this lovely day, which also happens to be the birthday of our beloved Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, who has made such paradigms happen and the leadership that he has shown has made a world of a difference. I am of course indebted to my father, Dr. Hiranandani, who has been not only my father, but a mentor and a guide up till the last days of his life and who participated and loved all the things that he did, including the, the colleges that were put up 
it was at his, his instance and my presidentship that the Nari Kurshani College was put up in the Ulasnagar campus. And of course, we're grateful to Professor, uh, Principal Nilima Chandiramani to come all the way from South Mumbai, which he was originally reluctant to do. But now I feel even she has adapted to this change and taking place to do it. So each and every one of you be ready for the future because the future will be changed. Because thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, for inviting me here today. I'm looking forward to hear from Garima Panwar, her part of the country. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, sir, for emphasizing on the issues which are rising in the current period and and I cannot agree with you more on the importance of vaccination. And yes, we too are eager to meet you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I call upon Abdul Desh Pandey to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Garima Panwar. Uh, thank you, Kinjal. Good afternoon to all. I welcome you all and our all guests, and uh, along with uh, Garima Panwar, ma'am, Professor Garima Panwar, for today's event. Professor Garima, uh, Professor Garima Panvo is serving as an assistant professor at Hindutva National Law University, Raipur. Also worked as an assistant professor in two best law colleges. One is Symbiosis Law College, Pune, and another is Institute of Technology, Nirma University of Ahmedabad. She has an initial job experience as a law clerk, come legal research assistant, assistant in Rajasthan High Court, Jodhpur, under the Justice Govind Mathur from January 2016 to June 2016. Professor Garima Panwar has completed her BA LLB from Hindatul National Law University of Raipur in 2015. Also completed her LLM from Nalsar University of Law of Hyderabad in 2016. She is a very keen learner. Therefore, she has attended many of seminars and additional courses to be updated with the current affairs and knowledge Subjecting, subjecting to development perspective of intellectual property law, private international law, and online teaching and learning tools. Also, she has been invited as a speaker in many of the colleges for subjects like artificial intelligence and law, artificial intelligence in auto, uh, autonomous vehicles, and a new passage to India at Berlin School of Economics and Law. In addition to this, ma'am, have also submitted an international project on artificial intelligence law and policy and ethical legal regulatory framework for the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare sector with various articles on a study of interstate water dispute, character merchandising and emerging dimension of IPRs, settlement of international dispute, a case study of ICON infrastructures versus Challenge Degree Construction Corporation Private Limited, Competition Law and Consumer Welfare, and Article 141 of Indian Constitution, and Role of President was contributed by Professor Garima Panwa. So, here I pr proudly present our guest of event, Professor Garima Panwa, ma'am, who inspired all of us with the wonderful journey in a field of law and education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avdut. Now, I request Professor Garima Panwar to throw light and educate us all about today's topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nilima ma'am, for inviting me. And thank you, Niranjan sir, for your brilliant speech that you gave. It did give a background of the whole COVID issue and the way forward of it. So, continuing on what sir said with respect to the challenges of COVID-19 and 
um, how we have proceeded from vaccination and the basic problem or rather than problem, I should say the main hurdle that we were facing from since so long of access to medicines. So there's so many um, figures or the statistics which are there with respect to uh, how many cases have were there globally uh, with respect to the deaths relating to co coronavirus. Even WHO re report, um, uh, it, it said that there were so many cases which were reported in India and there were even casualties of the same. But the positive point definitely is that in India, we have so many, like India was successful in giving vaccination to so, so many people to such large masses. But the question that comes over here is that we are providing vaccines, we are providing medicines, but are they all adequate or not? Are they effective enough to treat each and every person and be affordable for every citizen of India or not? And for the same reason, even WTO pointed out that there are huge concerns that we may have developed vaccines, but is it available to uh, an afford at an affordable price and in sufficient quantity, not just to the developed countries, but also the develop the developing countries like India and the least developed countries. So, in the same line, one thing that have been resorted to that. Uh, IP, that is intellectual property rights, have been considered as a barrier. What are intellectual property rights? It's like a patent. For example, if a person creates a drug, a medicine, and that same drug is eligible to get patent protection under a particular territory. If, for example, if I create an invention I over that drug, I can get protection in India and that protection will allow me that no one can use this particular drug or medicine without my permission. Definitely, this is for a particular time duration, that is for 20 years. But till 20 years, no one can access it. So there was a huge debate. There is still an ongoing debate that is IP acting as more a barrier to access to medicine and is it, it, is it creating an imbalance? Imbalance as to private right of giving monopoly rights over one's invention. And it's conflicting with the public interest because this there are certain medicines. You, you must have seen even uh, when the second wave was on, there were many medicines which were not even accessible. They were not produced. So over there, oh, the question that comes is, should it not be a situation that if you are having dearth of medicines, let some other company use manufacture and then sell that particular medicine so that there's no scarcity of medicine. So from here comes the question of access to medicine and access to medicine when we are talking about and when WTO is also emphasizing so much, the World Trade Organizing is emphasizing so much, there is one agreement which World Trade Organization talked about was TRIPS, that is trade related aspect of intellectual property rights. Now, this agreement gave rights to all the WTO member that this is the minimum threshold of protection which you need to give to all IP, whether it's copyright, patent, industrial design. You cannot go below the threshold, but you can provide an additional protection. And being a WTO member, every member country is bound to follow this agreement. Even India is a party to this, US, Russia, all, all the countries, um, if I'm not wrong, the last data that I had checked into, there were 198 members of this TRIPS agreement. So when the TRIPS agreement is there into picture, and we have also incorporated the same under our patent act, the question comes, there is rights that provided. But given the condition of COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, do you think there should be some flexibility? There should be some leeway which should be given so that we are not just securing the private interest, but also the genuine public demands which are there. So for the same reason, the access to medicine, the first uh, suggestion that was given is that I use the TRIPS flexibility. The TRIPS flexibility is that there was a Doha declaration. So I go a bit in back, uh, uh, a, bit, a bit, I'll give you a bit history of it. In 2001, there was a Doha declaration. This Doha declaration, they realized that yes, 
trips is providing some absolute monopoly rights over certain inventions over certain industrial designs and all and because of the same reason there is no access to basic healthcare structure that's there basic healthcare system so when i'm talking about access to medicine i'm not just referring to drugs but also to the devices like so give example of the oxygen like how oxygen was procured and there were various devices or the vaccines also everything can be related over here so doha declaration in 2001 they realized that trips should not restrain the member countries from protecting their uh, their public from any kind of public health disaster and they should allow that there should be rather access to healthcare and access to medicines that's why they came up with the idea that let's give them compulsory license now what is compulsory license compulsory licensing is that for example i'll give you by example so there is a particular drug called as ax and there is a person this person has developed this drug he got a patent over this now this patent is not getting used this person is either selling it at a very high price or the patent has not been worked properly because of this this medicine is not accessible to public at large so compulsory licensing will be when the government authorizes a third party will take over here third party as b where the government authorizes third party let let this third party make use sell manufacture this particular product x so that it can be accessible to all in return what a will get a will in return get certain remuneration and the royalty that's there why is it called compulsory because a did not volunteer in giving this particular uh, x drug that's there so it's made compulsory by the patent office and eventually by the government so this compulsory licensing provisions were incorporated but the it was restricted only to domestic market domestic market in the sense that if a compulsory licensing is given to this person b then he can manufacture use and sell only within this particular territory who has given the right to use sell or manufacture so only within india they can do but the, there comes a question that there are many countries who are not sufficient enough or they are not having manufacturing capability in their pharmaceutical sectors that they can build up the whole sector uh from procuring the raw materials to building that particular uh, medicine or the device that are useful so for them this doha declaration said that let the countries who are sufficient let them export the products these pharmaceutical products now the the rules which are there if you refer to doha declaration they are detailed rules as to how the export will be made how the import will be made what will be the role of wto i'll give you an example of this so like it has been evident through many case studies and even through international discourses that india has a huge market of generic drugs we manufacture generic drugs and we do sell or even uh, pro bono without profit we do give it to the least developed countries specifically to south africa okay. how is it possible that we gen make a generic gen generic drug is that you apply reverse engineering over a particular medicine and you know about the components and you find substitutes about the components and you sell that uh, um, and the substituted chemical components at a lesser price so this is like this is one of the meaning of generic drugs which i can give you for so this like india is developing on that respect so this was even uh, discussed in the doha declaration and eventually it was incorporated under the trips agreement now when it was there in trips and india is there as a member of the trips agreement we also included it under a patent act so for domestic market we included these provisions and for international market for export and import of uh, and using of these compulsory licensing 
we included another section of section 92a now what i i'll not go too much into sections and details and all but through this we come back to the current problem that we are facing so section 84 it says that if there is any interested person if there is an interested person he says that i want to access this particular uh, invention this particular drug or this particular uh, medicine which is invented by another person so what he can do he can apply to the patent controller it's a government body and then that person has to prove that there is a reasonable requirement of this particular invention by public and the patent that is the person to whom this patent has been granted he is not floating this particular patent at an affordable price and or it's not even manufactured properly i'll give you one example this has actually happened and it's the only compulsory licensing that's been given so far in india it's natto versus bear versus natco ka case so there was a drug called as nexavar bear a company it uh, it used to manufacture it was the one who invented and it used to manufacture this particular drug and it was a life saving drug for liver and kidney cancers and the monthly dose of this was around 2.8 lakhs think of a, a middle class family or a low class family from india they won't be able to afford it also the number of units which were prepared for this particular medicines were also prepared less so there was dearth of this medicine as a result of which natco as a company they volunteered and said we want compulsory licensing in return whatever government decide we uh, reasonable price or remuneration or royalty will be given to payer but kindly grant this um, a compulsory like kindly grant us license like that is permission to manufacture use and sell this they were finally granted like after lots of controversies it was finally granted and natco thereafter produced uh, in uh, in huge numbers this nexavar and the cost reduced from 2.8 lakhs to 9000 per month so you can see how much amount uh, now how much it is affordable but the problem over here like given the current times of covid 19 why can't we not adopt this section 84 or the compulsory licensing through application is that it is because this in order to obtain a compulsory license before applying for this application it should be ensured that 3 years have passed from the date of uh, a grant of this uh, patent so for example if this x person if for example if bear hypothetically it had produced it or it had got the patent over its medicine in around 2000 hypothetically so before 2013 natco cannot file for the patent cannot file cannot file for the compulsory licensing for the same because 3 years are granted to that patent that you enjoy this patent you ensure that this particular patent or this particular invention is worked in india so only so this 3 years because of, and covid 19 situation we need to act immediately over that so ye this option not applicable to us now the next option that's there for us is section 92 now section 92 is the government will take suo moto cognizance suo moto cognizance in the sense so uh, the the government will take um, the it, like it will take action on its own without any application and it will say that we are ready to give it will declare in an official gazette that we are ready to give compulsory licensing over a particular drug if whether if in case there is a national emergency if there is an extreme urgency or if it is proved that there is non commercial use of like we will be using that particular invention for non commercial use non commercial use like for example uh, vaccines are procured if the same is being sold in government hospitals it's a free of cost so like don't compare it don't get confused with the compulsory licensing under section 92 so 
Section 92 in eventually says that an invention can be taken by the government and the government can say that now anyone can manufacture this, use it or sell it. He, owing to these conditions and there is no cap on the number of years that should have elapsed from the grant of um, patent. So this has been the most debatable owing to the current novel coronavirus, um, the situation that's, uh, that's there. And we'll continue on the similar lines in the upcoming uh, like, uh, session. Okay. Another thing that was there is under section 92A, we allowed for the international market that if India wants to export any invention, uh, to any other country who are incapable or who are not having the manufacturing capacity, then India can do the same subject to the condition that the other importing country, they are also ready and also the proper permissions have been taken. So over the period of time, this section 92 with respect to compulsory licensing, there were many countries who have actually allowed or they have made amendments or changes in the existing legislation saying that we will allow for compulsory licensing. This is a health emergency. And in case any, um, any of the manufacturer is interested in any of the medical devices and producing manufacturing medical devices, ingredients, or even the medicines and drugs, then they will be issued license within 30 days. This was by Brazil. Same was there by Indonesia, Germany, Australia, on similar lines they were working. When there were so many compulsory licensing steps which were there all over the world, one of the questions that was raised by Supreme Court, Supreme Court this, uh, took this cognizance in, in redistribution of essential supplies. There was a separate case which was there. And Supreme Court emphasized that in order to tackle the issue of vaccine requirements, the medicine requirement, because they saw what was the condition in the second wave. So they emphasized that there should be rather compulsory licensing resort that should be taken under Section 92. So court said that please consider this as a national emergency situation. And they requested the central government that you kindly take such steps that under section 92 uh, ensure that there is compulsory licensing of basic uh, medical supplies and the same could be shared by any of the private enterprise and they can manufacture so that we meet the need of our when this was there in furtherance of the same even one of the Rajya Sabha reports uh, when they were reviewing the IPR regime in India they also said that if you do not pay heed now, it will be very late. So it's better you consider compulsory licensing as a good tool for production of medicine and vaccines and for related treatments of COVID-19. But what was the reply for government? Government said that we also have to take into consideration as to what is the international stance whether there are international bodies who will be agreeing to our compulsory licensing. In addition to this, uh, there was also a Niti Aayog press report which was launched and the press report was named as the myths of vaccine. And in this particular press report, they actually clarified that it's not that we don't want, as a government, we don't want that compulsory licensing should not be there. And we are also aware as to the benefits of compulsory licensing. But considering the overall situation, compulsory licensing is not a very attractive formula because it's not just that we'll grant compulsory license. Government will one day declare that this particular medicine or this particular device is uh, is open for any manufacturer to be used, sold, or manufactured in return of the uh, equitable remuneration that's there. But the question comes eventually as to who will take this compulsory license. Do we have adequate human resources? Do we have adequate raw materials or even setups that are that are there? We do not have even. There are many places. There are many states. With, who do not have the biosafety labs. So government is ready to do, but it's not that, that it's the only option that's available. So let's explore other options. 
and for the same reason government explored the best as per me it was the best solution which india could give india went to wto and when it went to wto it asked for trips waiver okay and this was one of the means to ensure access to benefit access to all the medicines or the medicinal supplies which were there okay? so what exactly happened over here over here india and south africa went to wto with a proposal now in that proposal they specifically requested that we agree to the fact that trips is providing protection for inventions over many industrial designs so you like wto as an entity should rather allow for a limited time duration exemption to apply the trips in their respective domain i'll again like i can rephrase this and explain in a better way okay? so think of india as a country now there are many drugs or there are many medicinal supplies which can be easily available or which are manufactured in many other countries like xyz countries india wants to use the same but india will be prohibited stating that if you use it if you sell it into your market then you will be violating our patent rights or you will be violating i designs industrial designs rights so for the same reason india and south africa they offered that you temporary waive off the trips and temporary waiver with me that if temporary we will not be applying or employing or enforcing the patent protection which is given patent protection or many undisclosed information there are many and uh, agreements which are entered between the parties that this is the medical information and we will not be sharing the same you know, or there are designs which are relating to the copyright supply so uh, the medical supplies which are there uh supplies like vaccines medicines or the covid related technologies which are there so for all these things you give a particular time period to us and in that time period you do not punish us or you do not impose a penalty on us uh, and as a result of which this will enable us to export import any kind of generic drugs also it would allow us to meet the demand of the public without infringing any person's right thinking from the perspective of a developing country or the least developed countries they would be definitely benefited from this because there will be someone who will be manufacturing and without infringing anyone's right everyone will have access but thinking from the perspective of a developed country they will definitely not like about it there there are, there are countries who are asking for data ex exclusivity there are countries who are saying for increasing the term of patent from 20 years to more so they never like this trips waiver and they wanted more clarifications or exemptions even under trips waiver so after this Like we floated this idea in October 2020 to WTO. Again in May 2021, a revised proposal was said, and it stated that we are not concerned with the trips waiver for all the health supplies, but only the health products and technologies relating to COVID-19 prevention, treatment, and containment, because the need of the R is to protect against to. prevent this particular uh, disease and the pandemic that's there okay? also they said we are not asking for an absolute trips waiver for even for covid-19 prevention uh, health products and technologies but only for a time period of 3 years after that this 3 years you can definitely again impose all the trips restrictions which are there and the person who is enjoying and the invention let that person enjoy we will not create any hurdles so when this amendment was made us agreed for this and they they agreed that let's enter into negotiation a uh, text based negotiation and they came up with a special report and they agreed at least to negotiate and they said that yes it's a viable option and it can be considered 
So, giving all these background, let me give you an example. Take for example, there is a particular country called as A, and there is a particular country called as B. A country is not having adequate supplies for all the health related health related supplies, specifically in the COVID times. Medicines are not there, or even the tools and equipments which should be useful, they are not there. And B country, who is excelling in manufacturing, who has great manufacturing capability, and also is having a good base for producing the generic drugs. If we have to apply the TRIPS waiver, what will be the benefit for this country A? This country A will merely apply, we can, can directly go to B and say that I want certain drugs, medicines or med uh, other medicinal supplies which has been manufactured, which has been patented by someone else, but because it is relating to protection or prevention of COVID-19, I want this much amount or this much quantity of supplies to be provided. Now, B country without any restriction will provide the same. The benefit of TRIPS waiver would be, it will be just one time all the countries have to accept that TRIPS waiver is there. And for the next three years, at least the least developed countries and the developing countries, they can get benefited. They don't have to go behind all the procedures which are involved. Okay. Another, like, if this is TRIPS waiver, one step back. What if we give this compulsory licensing, the sewer motor licensing, which is given in India under Section 92? That is, government uh, through patent controller, it will issue a, an official gazette saying that there's a national emergency and we will allow compulsory licensing for the same. But the problem in this will be, first of all, declaring of a national emergency, health emergency I'm referring to, itself is a cumbersome uh, itself is a cumbersome process even if it is declared there will be many manufacturers or the companies who will be willing again they have to go to a huge negotiation process with the the original patentee after negotiations they will come up with a particular uh, royalty rate or the remuneration rate and then the compulsory licensing will be given so a lot of time is wasted and especially when we don't know when there is a spike in the cases, like you cannot actually predict that at what point of time the COVID-19 cases will spike and there will be a dearth. So you are losing lots of time. Okay. Another is with respect to supplying to other countries. Like India, India has time and again, they have showcased that we are ready to supply like even in, um, in the recent times when other countries they ask for um, like chemical compositions or many of the medicinal supplies India had provided for the same and to countries like Nepal we had provided even free of cost so India as a country is ready to supply or even you take for, for example this country B this country B is also ready to supply at a lower cost but Applying the provisions of Doha Declaration or the TRIPS Agreement, the huge there will be a huge procedure that you first go to WTO and the importing country will take permission from WTO. Then importing country will enter into a negotiation with the exporting country. Like for example, the importing country is South Africa and the exporting country is India. India will first uh, uh, enter into all the parliamentary debates which are there, then there will be a negotiation under cabinet and then a particular agreement will be drafted. And India will take permission from WTO. On the contrary, South Africa will also take uh, permission from WTO and after all these permission sense, they will be notified that we are about to issue compulsory licensing and we are about to give certain drugs at a cheaper rate or we are give, or we are providing this supplies so when this export is there export import is there and along with the national laws it increases the time more more than the time that was taken in the domestic market so what we can see over here is 
that trips waiver it's still in the negotiation phase and if this negotiation phase continues for so long then no doubt third wave might also come and then we'll be arguing that we are very late means so, and, and the same thing was also pointed out by director general of w, uh, who he said that if you're not agreeing with the trips waiver now then what are you waiting for then when will you be implementing the same for sure that until and unless the trips waiver is finally accepted at least allow for the compulsory waiving or even if we are allowing for the compulsory licensing one step that can be done is reducing the formalities which are there for the trips uh, for this particular compulsory license but we cannot deny the fact that yes government is taking active steps for even reducing the uh, formalities but again we are stuck somewhere in the process so compulsory license can be taken as a flexibility or as a chance to allow that there is a balance balance and ensuring that the rights of the public is upholded and they also get access to the medicines which uh, which they require specifically in the challenging times that's all from my side thank you so much Thank you so much, ma'am. We all have for sure benefited and made ourselves more clear through your effective talk. Thank you so much. You. Now, now I request all our participants to fill out the feedback form which has been given in the chat box. So, without any further ado, I call upon Rishikesh Chandratre to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, Rishikesh, go ahead with your vote of thanks. Kushbu, please unmute him. I think he's not able to unmute himself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Kinjal. Uh, greetings to everyone present here. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge all the hard work and dedication of each person in making this event a grand success. Niranjan, sir. It has always been an enriching and insightful experience for us to hear from you. And even celebrated in a memory of legendary surgeon, Dr. L.H. Hiranandani, and having his son, Niranjan, sir, as our keynote speaker, we couldn't have asked for more. Thank you so much, sir, for adorning our occasion with your presence. Garima, ma'am, we still remember attending your and Ratsar's webinar on artificial intelligence. The commendable art of in-depth analysis and research had perhaps inspired many students to further explore various aspects of AI. Even today, you have unsurprisingly kept on the legacy. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking out a few hours from your schedule and agreeing to become our guest speaker. We look forward to have with us in our future too. And of course, our heartiest gratitude to all our audience, volunteers, and all those hands behind the curtain who have been our constant supporters, it's because of you that we are able to conduct such a memorable talks every single year. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Rishikesh. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much. And we would also like to place on record a big thank you to HR College and Kushbu and Jayant for constantly supporting us, you know, with their technical team as such. Thank you so much, both of you. And I think uh, we can now wind up with the program uh, with ma'am's permission. Thank you, Garima ma'am, once again. Uh, Nilima ma'am, if we may uh, now wind up with the program, unless you have to say the parting words. Uh, thank, thank you, Sandita. Yes, I would like to say my parting <laughs> words. First of all, I would really like to thank Honorable Provost Niranjan Hiranandani. He set a beautiful landscape, a background for Garima to fill up. And Garima, you were simply brilliant, too good. In such a lucid manner, you have explained this. You know, I love patent law, but even I learned so much from you. The way you have linked 
patents with TRIPS waiver and WTO, and especially in relation to COVID and the formalities which you know caused the entire delay. It was such a wonderful insight that you have given us. I'm extremely grateful to you for having spent your precious time on us. God bless you very, very much. Thank you, my dear. And thanks to all of you. And my special thanks to the team from HR College, Kushbu and Jain, for giving us that support. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank, thank you so much, much ma'am. So, uh, so let's wind up with the program today. So I thank request, uh, yeah, I request Kushbu and Jayan to wind up with the session today.